well, it was your choice to have children. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a recreational side hustle. It is laced with pain. It is laced with separation anxiety, postnatal depression. It's laced with financial insecurity. But with my mum, sorry, she had no choice. And she was there, 47, just slumped by the dishwasher, recognising everything she had given up and lost. She'd gained it all in me and my sister, but... I'm fighting through trauma. It's not because I simply want to raise my children in a different way. It's because I don't want them to face the same thing my mum had, which was having no choice. I just want to say thank you and I appreciate the work that you're, you're doing because I'm coming from a generation of a mother who, who did work, who then did not work and who to some extent was also punished for that for me personally has made me almost want to rebel against that and I'm just going to be so good and so determined that it doesn't really matter if the doors get slammed in your face I'll just keep on going it's like I'll just prove everybody wrong stop waiting for women to fix it stop waiting for activists to change legislation quick question when did you discover that you're a leader that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Let's start. It always feels like, oh, all of a sudden, it's like, you're on. <laughs> Anna, so much, such a pleasure to meet you. And thank you so much for coming onto the show. And I've been so looking forward to speaking with you because obviously following you on Instagram and listening to your podcast and the human stories that you talk about, especially when it comes to women in the workforce. And I know you're not just campaigning with the flex appeal for just women. But to me, obviously that speaks a lot because as a, as a person who became a mother four years ago, I've only just realized how much the workplace hasn't really been designed around women and how difficult it is to navigate that world. And I'm just really excited to talk to you and to learn more about what you're doing with Flex Appeal and yeah, just talk to you and like absorb well, all your knowledge. So thanks for having me. Yes. I'm afraid my voice is a little huskier than usual. So I'm it gonna... sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope you, your, your voice holds on and uh, we it can will. keep on chatting. Um, so, I mean, in terms of you campaigning for flexible working. You've been doing that well before the pandemic, since 2015. Can you tell me, what, you know, how did the idea for Flex Appeal come about? So Flex Appeal, which is our, mine and my husband's campaign uh, to fight for flexible working for everyone, uh, very specifically, not just mothers. Um, it started in a very primal visceral maternal place, uh, which was, I'm from uh, Holland, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, I had my first baby over there. And you get 10 days of a maternity nurse on the equivalent of the NHS, okay? So my first baby, I had a maternity nurse living with us, looking after me, making sure I could breastfeed, wrapping her arms around me. And the reason uh, Holland does that is because it saves uh, their medical system a lot of money in maternal mental health later on. So if they invest in women post-birth in that vulnerable moment, uh, it cost them less. So I'd experienced that. And then I'd gone back to the workforce in the Netherlands. They had a mama dach, a papa dach, which was equally weighted between mum and dad. No one went back full time. Uh, it was very much family at the top than business. 
I came back to the UK and I was hit by a wall of instant discrimination. And I think if I hadn't experienced what it could have been like, you know, and I want to stress to anyone listening right now, this isn't some fictitious utopian world that I'm dreaming of. It exists elsewhere. And I'm not saying the Netherlands is perfect, but you know what? Scandinavian countries are getting there. And we are so far behind. And I think when... I had my second and I put that flexible working request into my employer. Um, I was working at the L'Oreal Group and I didn't leave because I wasn't worth it. I was a senior copywriter there. Mm -hmm. Uh, My boss loved me. I loved her. And her response to my flexible working request being uh, rejected was, well, if we give it to you, we'll have to give it to others, which will open the floodgates to flexibility across the company. And all I was asking for was to come in 15 minutes earlier and leave 15 minutes earlier to make nursery pickup. And I suppose to answer your question, Flex Appeal began uh, in that moment where I wanted to question, well, why can't we open those floodgates? People are drowning behind them, but also businesses are losing talent. I was great at my job. And I think my employer has now seen everything I've achieved outside of that company. And I can only hope they are fully aware of what they let go for what a 15 minute, uh, for 15 minutes of flexibility, Mm. which in business terms, I think cost them a lot. I just find it incredible that employers still to this point don't see how they are losing talent, especially female talent in the workforce, because... As I said to you, I mean, I personally didn't think there were any barriers to me because I used to work for, you know, predominantly female led companies. So it never really entered my mind. Yeah. And then when I became a mother and even though I have my own business, I was like, oh, like that's what it's about. I think that's it. And all of a sudden I started to think, wow, the world of work isn't really designed for women. Well, it's inclusive working more than anything. I think uh, flexible working feels a bit like something managers have to do, right? It's another thing to add to your list. Inclusive working is why would you not want the top talent at your table? It's actually no more complicated than that. And uh, the Peterson Institute did an incredible report, the biggest of its kind, across uh, 2,890 companies, 92 countries. And it found if you have 30% or more women at the top of your company, you make more money. So this isn't about a thing that you should do. It's not about uh, even a diversity and inclusion issue. You know, it is an issue, but it's not to do it for that. It's to do it for the bottom line. That's the bit that uh, astounded me was that companies were so short-sighted that they couldn't see that including uh, those who are disabled, uh, more women, who ultimately, if you are, let's say, a brand like Pampers, you want, to under- you want to understand your consumer. Why would you not push more women, as many women as you can, to the top of that company to understand the person you're selling to? It's about cold, hard cash. Uh, obviously, the byproduct is inclusion. Um, but that's the bit that has uh, really confronted me within businesses is that inability to see that by not uh, including, and there is a very clear link from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, that if you want to close the gender pay gap, the primary way to do that is with flexible working. So Mm. it's on the table. We know how to do it. And it costs nothing. Mm. You know, it's not asking companies to uh, put investment into this. It's asking them to understand the needs of employee in a working world, as we said at the beginning of this, that was set up in the industrial revolution when men went out, earned the bacon, brought it home, women cooked it. That does not happen anymore. So it is about uh, adjustment in business. And the truth is uh, any companies that don't get with the flexible working program are quite simply going to be left behind. Mm. Talent will not want to go to them. So They already don't. I no. mean, that's already happening. But going to your point about the system, sort of the nine to five coined during the industrial revolution, why do companies still insist on working in such a way? I think there is an archaic layer at the top. Uh, let's use specific examples here, like Lord Sugar 
for example, bleating the other day about uh, working from home, just not working. What he's forgetting there is that uh, it's not about working from home. Flexible working is compressed hours, it's core hours, it's job shares. Working from home is one strand of that. And this binary argument that politicians are using now, going, we all miss water cooler moments. Oh my God, get everyone back. I'm sorry, but I haven't had a great water cooler moment that's going to mean that I, tr- I prioritize that over seeing my child, you know? Mm. And that there's this fear from the Lord Sugars of this world, uh, we will lose control. And it's about control, right? Because if we're looking at money, uh, you make more money, people are more productive, healthier, less sick days if they work flexibly. So it makes no sense for them to be arguing this. I think it's very interesting to see a lot of the headlines around demonizing working from home are coming from newspapers that need to sell newspapers. Mm. So the footfall in city centers isn't there because of working from home. So that means they earn less money, you know? And so what they're going to be doing is slapping it on the front page of their newspaper. Oh my God, Reese Mogg is completely right here because, you know, working from home isn't working with no stats, no facts, no figures, just a need to sell their newspaper. So Mm. it's, if you start unpicking it and unpacking it, it's, uh, to answer your question, it's um, just this archaic layer at the top that uh, needs, that I think was bred with uh, this understanding that uh, productivity and uh, profitability within a company is based on where you, Maria, are sitting, not what you are doing. Mm -hmm. So if I can see you, you're working. No, the person that is going to be watching, let's say, homes under the hammer at home in their underpants doing no work is the same person that's going to be stalking their ex on Facebook in the office. Mm -hmm. You know, they are the same person. That's just a recruitment issue. That is not a flexible working issue. You recruit the right people, put them in the right position, support them. It doesn't matter where they work. Measure what people are doing, uh, not where they are sitting. Mm. I don't remember exactly where the stats have come from, but it was a study looking into whether people were this was during the pandemic, whether people were more productive if they had the flexibility to work from home at that time. And the people who were the most productive usually were even more productive outside of the office. And I found that fascinating how you're right about about the, the hiring of the right people. It doesn't matter where they're going to be working. I mean, if they're going to be scrolling, if they're demotivated and disengaged, it doesn't matter where they've been placed. sick days as well. Like, so sick days have gone uh, down significantly since people have worked from home. Because if you think about it, when you're not feeling very well, a hour and a half commute across London, when you are feeling under the weather, you know, that can shift how your mindset is if you are working from home. Mm-hmm. You just think, do you know, what I can actually do this today. Um, so sick days have uh, gone down. Productivity has gone up. Um, it's just people like Lord Sugar who want to fill office spaces and are flapping because they've invested in all this office space in city centres. So need to now uh, blast hot air out there to try and get everyone back, but no one is buying it. Um, mm. And I think that's the thing uh, you said where this began. It began into it began in 2015 in a very maternal place, uh, but what people forget is that uh, on, let's say, two weeks before the pandemic, I was uh, having meetings, campaigning, lobbying to industries, government, public sector, private sector, and I still had people going, I love what you're doing, but it won't work for us. Two weeks later, those very same CEOs, those very same leaders, those very same companies had no choice. On the 23rd, of March 2020, the companies that did not log on and zoom in had to shut down. So it's really interesting when you look at what is possible within businesses. And I think anybody listening right now to dig really deep on what is possible because the tech is there, the mindset is there, companies are proving over and over it can work. What is your resistance to that? Uh, And ultimately, uh, like I said, those that did not log on, they had to shut down. And I think it's interesting what is possible when cold, hard cash is at stake. Mm. And that for me (laughs) was probably the most pivotal moment in our campaign Mm. in a two week period, having, you know, 
the heads of business looking you in the eye going, love what you're doing with this little flex appeal thing, but, um, you know, we're just too big an industry or, um, you know, we are uh, in construction, you know, where it is possible uh, or we are the NHS, where it is possible. And I have lots of examples, which I will give you whenever we've got time on this um, to prove that. But yes, that was... It started in 2015, but really the pivot was 23rd of August, sorry, 23rd of March, 2020. Mm-hmm. Was that the biggest difference to your campaign, do you think, that point in time? Or what do you think made the biggest impact? I think people started listening before I was just seen as this knackered mum piping up on the streets for mummies. What it really compounded was that this was for everyone. This is for those who are disabled. This is for those with caring responsibilities. Uh, It is for those with anxiety. It is for everyone who wants to work in a business but does not fit into that archaic nine to five industrial revolutionized Mm -hmm. mold. Uh, That is what this is. And do you know what? The thing that frustrates me the most is Yes, businesses recognized in that moment that they had no choice. So I think businesses always thought they were in control. Pandemic hits. No, the companies that had already implemented flexible working policies, already had the tech in place, were able to flex around a pandemic. It is for the business as much as it is for uh, the employee. And that, I think, was the pompousness that was there before that isn't there as much anymore because they had their businesses shattered, you know, and uh, they they could have had control if they'd have actually just had some foresight. Um, but I think uh, the real the real shift has been in tech, you know, has been in in those in that month period uh, where we went into lockdown. Tech companies got on it, you know, mm. uh, and far from being seen as slacking, we were using Slack to our advantage. Far from being tech averse, companies were tech savvy within a concentrated four week period. Um, But what has come off the back of it has been, uh, as has always been within the flexible working conversation, companies willing uh, and really uh, awkwardly using employee examples to bring everyone down. So the person that maybe wasn't as productive working from home gets used as a case study for why we shouldn't be using flexible working for everyone. That, and I reiterate, is a recruitment issue. Stop muddying the two together. Um, Consider your recruitment as integral to your business. Don't just quickly get someone in to cover someone because you can't be bothered to do the job. Get the right people in position, trust them to do their job, arm them with tech and and let them crack on and measure what they're doing. And if they are not working for you, that is recruitment. Separate that from how we work in terms of flexible working. Isn't it amazing how us as human beings, we're just so resistant to change until there's absolutely no other way, but you have to just make the change, which is exactly what has happened. And For me, the benefit of that is actually throwing all of, you know, all of this chaos and throwing all of the balls up in the air and seeing what actually is working and using data. And I suppose we also live in this world where technology is our guide and to some extent our savior in some ways where we can communicate and we can build relationships and we can also track what's going on. Mm. What? What I'd like to know is like the companies that are progressive and maybe that were already progressive before the pandemic, what were they doing differently? I mean, you're talking about, you know, recruiting the right people, about having, you know, possibly, you know, more diversity at the tops that can provide different perspective. What else are they doing differently? So there's lots of flickers of uh, positivity across businesses. I'm very, very reluctant to highlight specific companies doing things brilliantly because do you know what? It's not fair to do that. No one company is getting it right. Uh, And that's why I'm very uh, protective of my former employer. I'm not here to lambast uh, 
the L'Oreal Group, mm -hmm. I'm here to say they are represented. They are representative of many other businesses, you know, who don't know how to flex. They're mm. so confused. And I think uh, one example uh, is transparency. So uh, Deloitte way back had case studies on their website. Literally, you go onto their website, it was there right at the top of the banner. And you could click on that and it would have 40 case studies of how employees within their company were working differently. So you could go into your meeting, your interview, armed with that information. They're not hiding it. You can say, oh, I saw that, I don't know, Phil in recruitment uh, was campaigning two days of the week and working a three-day week. Uh, or I saw that Amy uh, in HR uh, at Deloitte was looking after her dad with Alzheimer's on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. And actually, my mum's not very well too, and I would like to work that way. Do you know what? You don't even need to give a reason for what it is. But what Deloitte did in that moment, and like I said, I'm not saying they are perfect based on this one glimmer of positivity, but what they did there was arm their employees with that assurance that uh, they are standing behind working differently and not just standing behind it, they are actually walking it. And uh, that was seismic. It cost nothing mm -hmm. to that company to open up on how they work differently. And I think what I'd love to see is that that's just standard, that uh, you're not going in to interviews, as I think anybody listening right now probably has, going, right, I'll just get to the end of it. They'll want me. And then I'll say, oh, I actually need to do four days a week. And then you don't hear from them again. Mm -hmm. That happens over and over because you know then the person that can do five days gets the job. Regardless of whether they're the right person for the job, it will be based on how long can they sit on a seat where I can see them. That's what it's based on. Mm. Um, so I think that transparency is huge. I think also there's a need in HR, and I get it, to have everything sort of written down, red tape, everything fixed. But the minute you have a flexible working policy, it becomes immediately inflexible. So it's impossible to write it all down and have it all signed off by HR because one department is going to work so differently to another. So what you need to do is empower your managers uh, to be able to trust uh, their employees and to be able to ensure that they can Give them what they want in a way that it's relationship, uh, not a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. I think that's the shift for me is those companies that don't go, right, do you know what, Anna, I own you. No, you don't. It's one part of my life. Yeah. And that ownership, I think, is what's shifting. Um, I'm going to give another example later with the male allyship that mm -hmm. uh, really fits with what companies are doing specifically. But I think really at the top of that, it's that transparency, openness and flexibility from day one. Not this 26 weeks in the job and then, please, sir, can I have some more? Mm. Uh, own it from the beginning. Uh, the only job that cannot be done flexibly is on an oil rig. Everything else. And I challenge any manager, any leader right now to think about how they can work. Any other job can work within the umbrella of compressed hours, core hours, job share, uh, working from home, hybrid working. I challenge you to tell me you cannot do it. And the NHS can do it. So they are road testing, ward led rostering at the moment, which is where they simply empower their nurses to tell the matron, this is how we're going to work this week. So instead of the matron owning the roster, the nurses own the roster. So if one nurse goes, right, I need to go to the nativity play on Wednesday and the other one wants to go out for a date with her boyfriend on the Thursday, they discuss that amongst them. Then they tell the matron. It frees up the matron's time. Flexibility can look so different in so many different places, but all I am appealing to in managers is to have that flexibility of thought, mm -hmm. creativity of thought. Um, think about inclusion. How can we include as many people at the table here? How can I retain my staff? You know, there's a staffing crisis in the NHS. This is not a nice to have. This is not just a DNI issue. 
This is about ensuring that there are enough people to save lives. Mm -hmm. So how on earth are you going to keep saying no to nurses who are burnt out on the floor who have saved us in a pandemic? When are you going to save them? And flexible working is the only thing that is cost effective, costs them nothing. And nobody would have thought before the pandemic of ward led rostering, right? You wouldn't have thought that's a thing, but that gives those nurses everything they need, mm. which is not feeling owned. No one wants to feel owned. Mm. And that's the very least we can do to those that were ensuring we were looked after. How on earth are we looking after them? Mm. The more you're talking, and I suppose, you know, I've, I've thought about flexibility really about, well, you know, being able to come in earlier or, you know, maybe I can have, you know, this day off and having that. But what you're saying is so much broader than that. And I think as us as human beings, we like to create processes and procedures which get us to a certain point. And with very large organizations, there it's very tempting to say, we've come up with this template, this is what it's working, and now we're just going to continue doing this until, you know, the cows come home. But actually an organization is a living and breathing thing that constantly evolves and changes. And and what makes up an organization? It's the people, it's their stories. And I find that incredible, that story about NHS, about, you know, how just by rearranging between themselves, they can then be completely present and not have to worry about whether their grandmother is unwell or that they're going to be missing a birthday party. And you think and of the teamwork there, right? So absolutely. you think of the two things you fix there mm -hmm. are um, ownership of their own autonomy, yeah. right? entrepreneurship and autonomy. That is what you want to give your employee, okay? They don't want to feel like they are just a small, tiny part of your business. They want to be a significant part of that business. It costs you nothing to shift that balance where they are in control. Anybody that doesn't um, pull their weight or work collaboratively, that's recruitment again. Deal with that on a HR level. Yeah. But if you have the right people and these nurses at Birmingham Women's Hospital, they're all brilliant. They did not want to leave their jobs, but they were burnt out on the floor. And the matron didn't have time to manage the bigger picture because she was just quibbling with people over rosters. Mm -hmm. But you then hand that back to those who work for you. And suddenly you've got them working together and going, do you know what? I know your mum's not well, I've got you. Because then that person remembers in three weeks time when you've got childcare issues, I've got you. Mm -hmm. And that collaboration is front and center. Mm. One of the core industries that I work with on recruitment basis is retail and they having the same issues because it, it is people that have to be present there. And I wonder if a lot of these principles can be applied there because that's a, a huge, huge issue, especially the fact that they have to be, the retail staff are treated differently to, you know, customer service, for example, that can work from home or head office staff who can have a little bit more flexibility turning up here and there. So I think they will benefit from, from a different creative way of thinking of how they can add that flexibility. To well, the I think that's it. The coming back to the pushback, uh, I have on this campaign and it's, it's justified pushback, you know, because you can't just focus this argument in white collared environments, you know, with sort of privileged elite who are essentially Lord sugar clones. Um, that's why I think, for example, the ward led rostering example is really powerful because the last place you'd imagine it to work would be there. But the second part before I come on to retail is in construction. Okay. So we worked on all of our research with uh, Sir Robert McAlpine. Uh, Sir Robert McAlpine came to me because they said the rate of male suicide on construction sites was through the roof. Okay. You have these big burly guys isolated on construction sites committing suicide at a rate that nobody uh, can understand or can control or can support. And the reason that was, was because of that sheer isolation of working on a building site for eight weeks uh, to an end, no contact with their family. Mm -hmm. And uh, between, I think since 2014 to today, there's been 8,000 men who've died by suicide on construction sites. So this is not a mummy issue. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about me wanting to see more of my babies. I do want to see more of them, but I also want to see more of an understanding of male mental health on construction sites. And they worked with us to find ways to ensure that these guys had uh, a 
break to see their family. You know, flexibility can be as simple as going, right, we now understand uh, the toxicity of that situation. So we need to ensure that these guys don't work any longer than, let's say, two weeks at a time. They need to go back and have touch points with their families, with their friends, mental health support around them. There's flexibility in that sense. Uh, you then come down to, let's say, zero hour, zero hour contracts, retail contracts, perhaps, where you need um, to be on that shop floor. There is no Zoom equivalent of helping somebody at a makeup counter to find the right shade for their skin, right? Mm -hmm. There might be a few uh, ways of doing it in terms of apps and, you know, new websites that are coming up to do that. But ultimately, John Lewis will need people on the shop floor. And that's where you come into job shares, for example. Uh, the understanding that there are people who want to do actually one day a week. You know, there are people who want to do four days a week. And in Whitehall, they um, introduced it's essentially uh, Tinder for flexibility. So mm. they put out this uh, function uh, internally, which I hope places retail environments do, where they say, I'm looking for a one day a week job. I'm a mum who wants to get back into the workforce, but I can't commit to four days a week. Mm -hmm. I want to get back in. So I want to do one day. It's not about the money for me. It's psychologically having presence in another environment. You put that in, somebody else puts in, I want to do four days. You meet for lunch. You present yourselves as a job share to the manager. Um, that's obviously internally, but I hope that that goes externally as well. I'm working on an app at the moment called Work Your Way, which is a bigger global version version of that principle. And that is where I hope that retail environments, you know, can shift. I also think on a basic level that if you are on a zero hour contract, which a lot of people are, uh, they are not flexible contracts. They are ultimately can be quite extortion. They can um, ultimately create more issues for an employee uh, than actually being on any other contract. And in that situation, a lot of the people I speak to, shift workers, just want an understanding of their shifts like two weeks in advance. So a lot of um, shift workers are finding out three days before that they need to work on a Monday at this time. How do you manage childcare? The childcare uh, system is outdated anyway. It's extortionate, but it's also the least flexible uh, environment, you know, so you can't match up your work with the childcare needs there, but you kind of have a chance if you've got two weeks to go. So flexibility isn't just about being present or not. It's, a, it's often about like with the construction example, okay, what is the mental health needs of this construction worker? Okay, what would the potential childcare needs be of a shift worker? And how long do they need to sort those shifts out? People aren't asking for the world. They're not asking for much. It's actually that flexibility of mind where an employer who doesn't have children or has a wife or a partner who look after the children so has no understanding of how difficult that juggle is. I hate the word juggle, but it kind of is more of a clunky jigsaw puzzle to put together. It's having that understanding in that moment. So again, not asking companies uh, to rip up uh, the map as they know it, asking them to simply think, empathize, understand. Accenture is now leading with EQ, emotional intelligence, as well as IQ. Put EQ into the situation. Think about your employees in that way and actually landing somebody with a shift three days before when they have children, that's not going to work. So think and plan better. That's, that's flexibility there. And it's not ideal and it's not perfect. Um, flexibility won't be perfect. It's about a relationship, right? And your relationship with your partner isn't perfect. Mine with my partner isn't perfect. I am not expecting any manager here to go, right, we will give employees everything they need. That is not what I'm saying. Flex is a two-way process from employer to employee. It's about understanding uh, and that relationship. Recognizing both sides won't get exactly what they want, but you can meet in the middle. At the moment, it is one-way traffic from employer to employee. We do 468 hours of unpaid overtime a year, okay? We've accepted that. How many of you listening right now have just gone, well, I've got to just get this deadline done. Of course, I don't expect to be paid more. Why not? <laughs> like, yeah. Why on earth were we not pushing our employers to say, I've done 15 hours of extra work this week. I don't want just a pat on the back. I've missed time with my family. Uh, my mental health is on the floor. This is costing me more than my time. 
And yet we've accepted this for years. All I am pushing for is to address that imbalance. Uh, And that's it, a relationship, meet in the middle, understand the needs of your employee. And then I think uh, coming back to the cold, hard cash argument, watch how a little bit of empathy can go a long way in terms of that bottom line. I think the shift is happening in terms of it's not a one-way street anymore. It's a conversation that you can't just keep pushing and expecting more and more of your employees no. because they're going to break and they're breaking and they're leaving in their droves. And if you want to have an organization with completely burnt out people who have no longer the capacity to continue, well, what kind of an organization is that going to be? But also what you're saying is that statistically or when you are putting the human beings first, it has the impact on the business from a business perspective in terms of its revenues and in terms of its productivity. And that to me, I feel like that needs to be talked about much, much more, where if you treat human beings like human beings, you will reap the benefits in many more ways. And a lot of people don't know that it was, you know, Sir Ian McKellen, uh, it was his great, great grandfather who pioneered the two day weekend. He was a factory worker and he was looking around as you and I are today at the workforce as it stands. He was looking around and just going, everyone's exhausted. I mean, why are we doing six days a week? Why are we not questioning this? That's, I think, it. coming back to where I began with this, I've experienced life in a different way in Holland. It's not perfect at all, but there, I know there's a roadmap that exists that can exist here. And he pioneered the two-day weekend. Do you see the CEOs and leaders of this world going, oh, I can't stand the two-day weekend. I'm not here for it. <laughs> he, he was a factory worker. Everyone's voice in this conversation is so relevant. This is not for activists to fix. This is not actually for the government to fix because they're not going to get on with that. You know, it's a lot of hot air uh, to secure votes over there. This is about cultural change uh, as well as legislative change. Um, and I think coming back to how uh, how we can move forward in this conversation is to recognize your role in this, that exactly what you said, you're not just a cog in a hulking great industrial revolution machine. You're a human who has so much to give to that company, uh, but you need to be understood to give the most you possibly can. And I think employers, well, yeah, employers definitely switch off the minute they think they have to consider the human. And that is all uh, I'm saying to businesses right now is if you don't consider the human, if you don't lead with EQ, you're the one that's going to lose out financially, not just emotionally. Yeah. I see one of the big shifts that is happening is because women have entered the workforce and the old system, the nine to five system, and even talking about the weekend doesn't apply anymore because women do want to be able to go in one day when they're re-entering maybe after having kids, or maybe they don't want to go in completely five days a week anyway. From your experience, both as a mother and dealing with working mothers, what do you think is the biggest barrier to women getting ahead in the workplace? I think it comes down to it seeming like it's a women's issue to fix. I'm really tired by that. I'm exhausted. And um, I wish there were more men standing up and speaking up, leaning in and recognizing that this is about them too. Uh, you know, currently one in 10 flexible working requests goes through for men, four in 10 goes through for women. So the weight of uh, that sort of burden of childcare is still strapped to female shoulders. So caring is a female responsibility as far as the workforce is uh, aware. I think men, I was going to say historically, but I think actually in 2022, find it emasculating, asking for flexible working. What is emasculating about looking after your own child? Um, I know so many brilliant men who do want to do more, who are leaning in, not just uh, these old tropes of, um, you know, the hapless dad and daddy daycare and dad's babysitting. No, the majority of men I know are brilliant fathers. What they are faced with is the archaic dinosaurs at the top who believe women very firmly should be in the home. 
you know, they might not be saying that, but they're thinking it. And I can give you a very good example of how this plays out. The unconscious bias that sits there is the biggest issue in terms of women getting a it's the biggest issue in terms of women getting ahead. Um, there was a guy who wanted two days of flexibility from his boss. Uh, and this is in a big bank uh, in the city. And his boss said, well, you know, can't your missus do that? And he looked at his boss and he said, my missus is a brain surgeon, so you can pick a lane on who deserves the flexibility here. And it was that coming back to the unconscious bias of the assumption that, of course, it would be your bird who's going to pick up the childcare slack. Uh, and don't get me wrong, not every every woman needs to be at the helm of, uh, you know, in, at a, in a big medical career to be afforded any kind of flexibility. But it just shows that even in 2022, there are bosses that believe um, men should bring home the bacon and women should still absolutely cook it while doing everything else, not even going to get onto the domestic load. Um, so I think our biggest barrier is that unconscious bias. I want men to step up, not just to the plate, but for, and I hate saying this because um, they should be doing it for other reasons, but you know, think of your own daughters, like your own sisters, your own mothers, your own great grandmothers and grandmothers who were pushed to the wayside for their partners, for your grandfathers or your uncles' careers. Um, women who had so much potential to change the landscape of the working world and the world was not set up for them to succeed. And um, I legitimately don't care whether you are a woman or a man raising a child, boy or girl. Uh, I cannot raise my children and I don't think you can raise yours, to work hard in their ABCs, uh, to work hard in their GCSEs, to maybe get their A-levels, to perhaps get to university, to get into that first job. You remember that moment where you had your first phone, your first computer, and you felt that you could achieve anything and everything in that moment. Your family, your mother, your father had built you up to that. But actually what they had done on both sides is build you up for a fall because I was built up to believe I could do everything. And actually the minute I had a child, the minute sperm hits over them, uh, to be really blunt, uh, the door closes in your face. It's not just closed, it's slammed in your face. Uh, this is not a hunch. This is not some fictitious feeling. Uh, 54,000 mothers every single year are made redundant or discriminated against on maternity leave. But the other side of the coin, coming back to how to fix this, is I wonder how many dads want to lean in, want to step up, but are essentially cock-blocked mm -hmm. by this layer at the top that is saying to them, you aren't a man if you don't sit here five days a week working, you know, till you're burnt out and not seeing your family. Uh, you know, I want that toxicity, uh, not just, I think toxic masculinity is overused and has mm -hmm. kind of become a little, um, a I suppose, bashing. yeah. And it's mm -hmm. not that it's deconstructing, like on that, uh, construction site, mm -hmm. deconstructing a man's role in the workplace, but also at home. Um, and I still to this day will never forget that, uh, I was campaigning alone, as a mother, and no one was listening to me. I was knocking on the doors of Downing Street. I was knocking on the doors of Whitehall. I was knocking on big business doors with a very real issue, something that could help them make more money. I had it clearly in front of me. I had all the facts, the figures. I'm articulate. I knew I could get to the core of this, but nobody listened to me until my husband stood by my side. Sorry, I get really emotional talking about it. I wanted you to talk about this story because... There's several women who came onto the show who talked about that they had to get a male, you know, not even a partner, but somebody to go in and pitching with them because they and pretending that they were their assistant and not the founder. Yeah. Um, there was another founder who got her husband to go pitching as well, kind of setting him up as the lead again. And I don't want to, actually, I don't want the person to. I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you about the story, like when we're not talking on the podcast, but it, it makes me very, very angry that women are not being listened to. And the only way that they will be listened to is if they do have a male supporter. And when the male supporter doesn't want to 
support you all of a sudden that you're nothing and that you shouldn't be listened to. And that to me is such a sensitive subject that I think as a result, that personally I have felt that I have to be so independent, so strong, I'm not, I'm going to ignore that the bias exists and I'm just going to be so good and so determined that it doesn't really matter if the doors get slammed in your face, I'll just keep on going. And that's not a way to be either. And when you're talking about, you know, we're talking aside that, it's some of the, the women that have been the barriers as opposed to the men because they've had to work so hard and fight so hard and to be quite tough and quite almost ignore the emotional side of it just because it was very difficult to get ahead. And for your experience to feel that what you have to say is so good and you are extremely articulate, very eloquent, very passionate, and that yet that still doesn't cut through the noise of what's going on. It's never enough. And you are minimized every turn. Um, and I would turn up in uh, Whitehall meetings and you could tell there was an air of, well, who's this bit of fluff at the table? You know, and I, I, I'm not speaking out of turn there. I'm not the only one who has felt that, you know, and that's at the heart of government. You know, can you look around Parliament and see yourself reflected? No. Can you see uh, an entire, you know, if this is the heart of our country who are guiding us through, um, you know, pandemics, uh, cost of living crisis, how are they going to understand us if they're telling Stella Creasy to get out uh, with her baby? You know, how are they going to understand us if there's no maternity leave in Parliament? How are you going to retain women who understand women like you and I? they're not there. They don't exist. So the very heartland of uh, our country doesn't represent us. Mm -hmm. So how are we mm -hmm. ever going to be heard? And um, I agree with you. I don't think my bad experiences within business, and I say bad as in discriminatory, have been from men, actually. I think the majority of men outside of parliament <laughs> do want to support women, 100%. Uh, this is not a man bashing exercise. Uh, I have had more issues from women at the top because, and I say this really strongly, they have gone through things that I don't think I will ever understand to get there. There are women who have not had children uh, in the face of being able to get a promotion. This is back in like the 90s, noughties, you know, even more recently. Um, these are women who have been not just minimized in the way that I felt minimized, who have had brick walls built in front of them every step of the way, and they have punched through them. They've had no tools. They've had no support. They have bleeding knuckles. They are broken, but they are there. And I don't uh, in any way feel resentment towards those women. What I do wish is that we're coming back to EQ, emotional intelligence, is that um, to understand how to shift things for the versions of themselves that had the door shut in their face, that they kept punching through, please think of their 24 year old self and how it would have been better for them to have a door opened <laughs> so they can walk through instead of having to use their bare hands to claw through it and to get to the top with splinters, scars, pain, trauma, and it is trauma, to then not be able to afford any understanding, and this is where flexibility comes under that umbrella, to that 24-year-old version of themselves faced with the same brick wall, the same door, slammed, not shut, in their face. Um, so it's, yes, it's a mother's plea, but it's also um, a human's plea. I'm not talking about gender here. It's a human's plea to businesses, to... Put humans above your business, but for business benefit. That's it in a nutshell. That's the link is it's not rocket science that if you dig deep and think on a human level, that will translate to profits. And even if you do not, in, even if you think the woke brigade are here, you know, you've heard all of these phrases, God, all these Gen Zers wanting everything, all these snowflakes. 
even if that is your mindset, it's interesting when you look then internally at your own family, knowing that you're essentially blockading your son from being a dad, your daughter from being a, a woman who works. That is it. Why can't the two have both? Mm. I mean, I feel like I'm so, <laughs> I'm so in it with the story that I just feel the unfairness of it all and what is it going to take to change that and we're going back to having male allies and having having an understanding of your struggles and how you can help your children get back sorry i'm just like i'm <laughs> sorry <laughs> it really kind of like you really made me so emotional about that i kind of lost my track of thought in terms of that because it just reminds me of my own well it's trauma isn't it you know it i is think trauma. It, people don't talk it about people don't talk about it in that yeah. terms people don't talk about it in those terms uh it's seen as a hr issue which becomes quite disconnected from mm. the reality mm. it's trauma it is fundamentally trauma when you are um, shut down, right? Mm -hmm. It's trauma when you are, and this is a real example, perhaps a radio presenter and you're on maternity leave and you see a billboard while you are postnatally depressed, pushing your buggy through town of a new female presenter on the billboard next to your co-host without them having told you that you've lost your job. It's trauma when you uh, go back into the workforce and they essentially demote you because they think you're not capable with baby brain and um, separation anxiety, or there's no understanding of the biology of what you've navigated mm. in that period. Uh, that's trauma. It's trauma when you go on maternity leave and you know your boss is saying to your maternity cover, she's probably not gonna come back. Why don't we lead with, she's gonna come back. Uh, it's abusive in so many levels and uh, you are right to feel like this because we have been shut down for so long in any kind of human response to what is essentially not just discrimination, but which is uh, it's abusive. Mm -hmm. It really is mm -hmm. because um, my hopes, my dreams as a little girl of what I wanted to do, which was to be a barrister, I trained and I trained. I did everything by the book and I got to my mini pupillage at Devereux Chambers. And do you know what I was met with? Was the QC was at the top. His son was the pupil. I looked around and I could not see any women past 30 anywhere. All I could see were handshakes and all boys club, uh, prioritization of um, anybody who had a connection with the people at the top, which were, again, coming back to the Lord Sugar clones, this archaic layer that needs to be deconstructed for, I think, just years, centuries worth of trauma mm -hmm. uh, at having your hopes and your dreams. And not just that, financial security mm -hmm. quashed. Mm -hmm. This is not just a frivolous, I wanted to be a doctor or I wanted to be a lawyer. This is actually removing uh, financial stability from a human. You're so right. You think you just hit the nail on the head because I got this flashback of going for my first proper job and having to put on like a black suit, you know, take a briefcase and I come in and it's literally 20 other, 20 men and me. There was not a single girl then. It was going for recruitment. And it was this typical kind of Wolf of Wall Street situation. It's like, here's a pen, sell it to me. And I mean, I did my best, but I came out of that and I was thinking, I just was there pretending to be somebody else, trying to fit in within this culture to get myself a job because I needed to be independent. I needed to go out and work. I didn't have a choice, you know, okay, fine. I could choose to go and marry somebody rich, but is that the only choice that I have now? Especially it's like, you can be anything you want. You can, you know, go out and, you know, get whatever job you want if, as long as you work hard enough, but it's hard work is not enough. You have to then pretend to be somebody else. And I walked out of that and I was so distressed. I was like, I'm never getting a job if this is what it takes. Like I, if they offer it to me, I'm going to say yes. But if they don't, which I don't think they will, I just felt 
felt so terrible. And it's all in these small moments. Like for a friend of mine, as we're having kids, you know, she, she calls me and she says, I've miscarried and I can't tell anyone because I will be seen as somebody who's trying to have kids and I don't want to be giving the impression that I'm not serious and I can't progress. Well, you know, we've played into the system. And I think that I did a post yesterday, I don't know if you saw it, saying things I regret. And the five things I regret the most, and I'm putting it fully on my shoulders, are thinking parents were slackers for leaving at 4.59 p.m., for miscarrying at my desk, uh, for fear of telling my boss that I was trying and then a promotion might not land, for sitting in interviews like you did and going, oh, yes, I'm really interested in the gym membership when I wanted to know about maternity benefits. None of that was ever offered up. By simply acknowledging and, and accepting a system that was minimizing uh, and ignoring mother nature's biggest task, right? So if you want to remove the emotion from it, um, raising a child, raising the next generation is quite simply uh, removing any, uh, you know, human connection to this, raising the next generation of employees, okay? If you think in that industrial revolution mindset, we are raising the next generation of workers for you, okay? It's not a little, uh, as lots of people I'm sure you've um, heard say, uh, well, it was your choice to have children. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a recreational side hustle. It is laced with uh, pain. It is laced with separation anxiety, postnatal depression. It's laced with irretrievable breakdown. It's laced with financial insecurity. And at that juncture, that biological juncture in a woman's life, uh, like you've said about your friend uh, and myself, and I'm sure many other people here who miscarried at their desk, a woman bleeding at her desk, losing a baby, not telling a soul uh, because of the fear of the discrimination and the retribution that will happen off the back of that. I say it very strongly, it's abusive and it's inhumane and no one talks about that. And I just want on a basic level, the working world to be human, not inhumane. That's all I'm fighting for and why companies pre-pandemic were shutting the door on my face when only two weeks later they had no choice but to shift. That's the juncture, that's the pushback where I want to stand up and say enough. I'm, I'm so glad that you are doing the work that you're doing because women have a voice Women have been standing up for these things for a long time, not being heard, but just your resilience and your determination and relentless talking about this is, I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate the work that you're doing because I'm coming from a generation of, you know, a mother who, who did work, who then did not work and who to some extent was also punished for that and not appreciated in a way has, for me personally, has made me almost want to rebel against that. It's like, I'll just prove everybody wrong. Mm. But what you're talking about is trauma. It's not necessarily coming from a good place. And I think when I said that I wasn't um, aware of, of, of the biases until I had kids, because all of a sudden I realized what exactly we're up against. Well, you were probably, which a lot of us do, manning up. You know, 100%. you were essentially adopting uh, the masculine traits of getting ahead until biologically you have no choice because your boobs are leaking. Your mind is consumed with a small life form that you're trying to raise. You know, these are biological things. They're not weaknesses. There is no weakness. It is biology that men do not navigate and the workforce is not equipped to understand or support uh, women in that at all. Um, and I think the trauma and it's generational, uh, which is I think what 
you know, you've said in terms of your mother, my maternal reference was my mum, who was a stay at home mum. I hate the term stay at home because I don't think any mother stays at home. I think, <laughs> you know, you are constantly trying to mm-hmm. keep your children entertained, park, whatever it is. But I remember very distinctly age nine, seeing my mum sobbing by the dishwasher, the irony of it being by the dishwasher, this domestic appliance that she had seemingly... And I think the point here is it's about choice, right? Uh, I am not here in any way, and I want this very clear, to say uh, everyone should work. If you choose and your choice is to stay home with your children, and do you know what? I think at some point that's going to be my choice. At this juncture, it's not, Mm -hmm. but I do want that period of time to happen. But with my mum, sorry, she had no choice. (laughs) And she wanted to work so much. And she was there, 47, just slumped by the dishwasher, recognizing everything she had given up and lost. She'd gained it all in me and my sister, but I'm fighting through trauma. It's not because I simply want to raise my children in a different way. It's because I don't want them to face the same thing my mum had, which was having no choice. Because when you are in control and you choose the way you work or what you do or how you manage things, then then that is when we are working in a human way, right? Um, but flex appeal is really, it's seen as fighting for the next generation. It's really fighting for the last generation. And it was a misunderstood generation who had no choice. Anna. <laughs> I can cry with you all day. <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> but um, I, I fully respect and support everything that you're doing. And what what can we do? And I'm when I'm saying we, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about my partner. I'm talking about my clients. I'm talking about the viewers, the listeners. Like, what can we do to support you? Stop waiting for women to fix it. Uh, stop waiting for activists to change legislation. Um, I think, think very specifically about your company. And I'm going to give an example of how you can do that. Uh, I met a guy called James Clary at Coots Bank and I was on a panel with him. He's got four children and he's high up at Coots Bank. I think he's the chief operations officer. So he's um, top level there. And one day he decided to sit his 40 strong team down and look them in the eye and say, what's the rub in your day? What stresses you out? Very simple question. He gave each person 10 minutes and it didn't take long and it didn't take much time for them to explain, well, I'd love to be able to pick up my child two days a week. That would mean the world to me. That will literally calm my central nervous system. Uh, Perhaps it is, like I said, somebody who um, has a parent with Alzheimer's. Perhaps it's somebody who uh, wants to see more of their partner. It can be anything or nothing at all. Uh, There doesn't need to be some dramatic reason for that. And what he did was he implemented flexible working within his team. Not everyone got what they wanted, but there was that meeting in the middle that we talked about earlier. Within three months, productivity in his team had gone up 40%. When he was questioned by Coots Bank, he was described as going rogue. He was then asked, because they couldn't deny the figures, so they couldn't change anything. He was asked to present uh, why he did it, how he did it, the facts, the figures, black and white in a book. What he did was he led with a photo of his secretary who had become engaged to, not disengaged from her partner in that time. And he put a photo of a human at the heart of a fairly inhumane industry. And that byproduct of profitability was really linked to the productivity of being human. So my plea on a very basic level is to lead with that kind of EQ, to go rogue. Do not wait for me to change the law. Do not wait for businesses suddenly to magically come up with some flexible working policy. It's not happening. Cultural change right now is how we can fix this. And the second part of that is to get your company to sign up to the Equality and Human Rights Commission's Working Forward Pledge, okay? If we're talking about transparency, 
It is a charter of flexibility within business and you sign up to it. There's accountability, there's transparency, and your logo is there amongst your competitors. And if you're not there, why are you not there? And I think for any employee listening, it's a good in with your HR department at the very least going, oh, have you seen this? Don't think your voice isn't relevant. It doesn't matter where you are in that company. It doesn't matter about the hierarchy. Please stand up, speak up, lean in and push the, like I said, humans above business, but for business benefit, but for business benefit narrative. Anna, it's been emotional. Thank you so much. It's been very emotional. <laughs> and um, I really, really thank you so much for sharing thank you. your stories and you're incredible. And follow at mother underscore pucker if you want to know more about how you can get involved, but also I suppose just to not feel uh, alone. That's the big thing here. You are not alone. Uh, and it is indeed trauma. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it, it's just the amount of people you hear from every day you just people just assume it's just a job and there's that minimizing of it and um um it, it, it's been helpful to explain it in the words that we used because uh I think businesses just uh section it off as this assumption that you will well, just you're so back. right about the trauma part because yeah. i feel like it, I mean, it goes to men as well it's almost like well i need to shut down because i need to carry on and i cannot be in touch with the My emotions, human side the yeah. human side because we just need to keep going and we i think during the pandemic we've had a little bit of a glimpse of that back again because actually even though we've had stability and peace in the world at least in our kind of environment we're still operating with the traumas of the past yeah. and we haven't fully grasped that we're actually using old systems to continue working when it doesn't suit it doesn't work it doesn't work at all and yeah and i think that the great thing is is that we now have uh these it's almost like join the dots these little incremental steps we didn't have a space or a voice mm. before because the internet wasn't there so yes. on a very basic level yeah. uh we were able to be forgotten because where could you speak up all the newspapers were led by uh, men so if you put a gender equality story on the table which i did over and over which is when i left journalism i couldn't do it anymore no one wanted the stories so i had to start doing it myself yeah. i was like if i'm not going to be commissioned mm -hmm. to write these really valuable stories um because there's an un misunderstanding at the top of who your reader is then i can't do it anymore and actually the great thing has been there's a lot of things to demonize about social media, but we wouldn't be having these conversations without it. Uh, mm. There's that transparency mm. and that's where the trauma is coming out, yes. you know? Um, but yes, I'm sorry. You've been one of the ones to go through it too. There's nobody I know who hasn't. No. And this, the problem is, is that these stories are suppressed. Completely. We, we don't even allow them to come up for our own selves. No. And the reason why I was started crying is because you know, I was telling you about my stepfather and he, it was his 60, it would have been his 60th on Sunday. He passed away because he had a brain tumor, but he was very famous. He was the breadwinner of the family. Everything centered around him. Yeah. And my mom and him got divorced. The way she was treated was appalling. And I was having a conversation last night, like a, like a three hour WhatsApp marathon <laughs> with a family, um, with family effectively. And just who was a man and just the way that it's portrayed about even feeling that you have been impacted. Yeah. It's like, but you've been, you have all these things now you have yeah. the house, you know, you, you, you live this life where you've been taken out of Russia and when how great he was and how well he was like, but, but through that, we all suffered. We all made yeah. sacrifices and, my mom made sacrifices and what does she like and she's seen as if like she was not important yeah and i that well, you're always is... secondary citizen to the breadwinner 
Um, yeah. And then actually that's, uh, but then when actually you're both breadwinners, you're still a secondary citizen as a woman. Yeah. So it's, um, I might have to scoot actually. Yeah, I don't know what time it is. Um, it's too Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.